So the Wicked Queen sits upon her bloody throne, having put to death all possible contenders to her reign of terror. But it isn't about power for her. It's about her god, Baal. Baal the Great. Baal the Mighty. He who should lay nations waste. But for this upstart and paltry sideshow of a god, down in this disgusting little corner of the world called Judah, where she had been forced to live with that wretch of a man, pretending to be his lover, pretending to be his wife, all biding her time, all waiting for that one moment when she might have a chance to exact vengeance upon the God of Israel, to exact vengeance upon that prophet, Elijah, who had seen so many of Baal's faithful men slaughtered that inglorious day when by witchcraft and great wickedness he called fire out of heaven and deceived everyone. Even that pathetic upstart Jehu, who by his intrigue and plot had seen her mother murdered, seen even this husband of hers, a king of Judah, murdered. What right did he have to challenge the line of Ahab, who had been faithful to Baal through thick and thin? It didn't matter who was laughing now with the heads of her own grandchildren smashed upon the stones of the castle floor about her feet, the eldest of them still bleeding out his entrails as he looks up at her and wonders why. A smile creeps across her lips. This is sweet victory. This is piety and true religion. This makes it all worth it. The line of David at last is snuffed out. And there shall be none to save, not from the hand of Athaliah, daughter of Jezebel, granddaughter of Ethbaal, which king of the Sidonians? I'd like to begin with a trigger warning. Oh, this oh, is yeah. completely, utterly mad. You're gone. Inside the genius. Someone needs to save this if man. If you're doing what himself. everyone else is doing, you're doing it wrong. One of the greatest epics ever produced. I tell a pastor. My father, yeah. Well, get ready. You ain't seen nothing yet. It had to be terribly disappointing when the messenger entered the room and she had been savoring such sweet victory. There was only one thing left to do. There was only one, one single human life left to extinguish. And that but an infant. A one-year-old baby. Uh, what threat could he pose? Of course, eventually, yes. The line of David held great sway as a symbol amongst these Judites, these Jews. And the promise that from this one would come some, what, stallion who mounts the world? What nonsense. But it always kept these Israelites in a willing rebellion against better kingdoms like her own. So to snuff out this infant life, what was it to cost to bring peace, prosperity? The land might even eventually rise up and cast off those greater nations to the north and to the south, Syria and Egypt. So it must have been terribly disappointing when the messenger entered the room, his eyes cast down, approaching the throne, not with certainty, but with fear, and announced to Athalia that this infant boy 
Joash by name, was missing. He was not where he was supposed to be. The, the nursemaids were there, and, and they now lay dead, the soldier assured her. But amongst all the cloths and all the corners and all the potential hiding places in the room, there was not a baby to be found. Rage fills her face. She grits her teeth, jaw firm. This shall not end like this, she rises, looking down in spite upon this Judite soldier, and insists, declares, commands, for she is now queen, that they ransack every corner and every bit of every room in this entire filth of a palace, until that infant is found and its precious little head dashed against the rocks. So the soldiers search. There's already been enough bloodshed that the chaos is spilling out of the hallways of the palace and into the minds and hearts and lives of the people of the city. Chaos and confusion and fear and a reign of terror that will last for years. But hiding amongst it, the least expected place one could possibly find such a thing. Was he bustled in a basket? Was he carried in a in a box? It's hard to say, but apparently no one thought to question the daughter of Athalia, the granddaughter of Jezebel, the great great granddaughter of Ethbaal, which king of the Sidonians. No one thought to question her, for of course her faith in Baal would be strong. Of course she was part of this entire plot and plan. Of course she knew this was coming. So why? Why would she, of all people, why would she betray her vows and smuggle this small king of Judah, this small heir to the promises of David? Why would she smuggle him out of the castle and into the quarters of the high priest to whom she had been wed for strictly political reasons in order to manipulate all things to this very moment why would she take him the heir to the throne but that's exactly what she did and that she did it is only slightly less interesting than why she might have possibly done it what in all of wide hell or great heaven could convince such a person, such such a daughter, such an heir herself to a lineage filled with what? If not religion, then at least a fanatical spirituality. What could pull her from her gods, who, make no mistake, do not consider the life of a single human being of any real value. Do not make the mistake of believing that your Americanized assumptions are shared with the history of the world. Do not be such a fool as to think that evolution would teach you anything other than that survival of the fittest means a, well, a lack of value to any single human life, a mere combination of atoms and particles and chance. Do not be so naive as to think that the great pagans of old considered your life worth sparing if your life was in the way of the goods of society or the world. Do not be such a fool as to think that human rights exist as an inalienable normal, obvious conclusion to the fact that you poop and eat and sleep. What in high hell could convince this pagan girl to have one ounce of mercy upon this boy who was the representation of the destruction of her historic peoples and culture? What but faith alone? Faith alone in a one true and holy God according to his word, spoken by his.
prophets. Now, we know very little, almost nothing about this girl. We really don't. It would seem that her name is Jehosheba. But that's about all we got. I am definitely speculating a significant amount in the retelling of this story, but you have to admit, it it begs for it, doesn't it? We don't know much about her, so I really cannot convince you with any sort of scholastic impunity that this is all about her conversion, that this is all about her faith, that she is just another, yet another, version of Ruth. Who, do you remember? So marvelously, having married this Judite man who had somehow, with great audacity, forgotten the promises of God that in his faithfulness he would always provide for them in the land to which they had been sent and given, and yet because of their disbelief, a famine had come, and so what did they do? But they abandoned the promises rather than return to the Lord your God, and they leave, and then while gone, they decide to marry some pagan wives. It never went well, even though they tried again and again, and it still does not go well today, mind you. As we American Christians seem to have no real sufficient or substantial place for our religion when it comes to the the world of love. Even so, by whatever miraculous bit of confession remained amongst the family of Elimelech, amongst his sons Malon and Chilean. I mean, perhaps Chilean really never wanted to leave, and he was just doing his duty to his father, and he was always faithful, and he brought his book of Concord and his hymnal along, and so even while marrying his pagan wife, he always intended to convert her. Maybe that's how it went. I don't know. But it really, it really wasn't according to the word of God that all this happened yet there. There she is, connected to the covenant and to circumcision and to these promises and to that land by a few simple words. So that when her husband is dead, and the hope of her mother-in-law is dead, and her mother-in-law even says, look, look, this God, this Yahweh, this one who said things supposedly to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's abandoned me. He, he's given me nothing. I go back to beg. So why, why don't you just go and continue worshiping Baal like everybody else in the region? I mean, he's, he's done better for everybody than God does by us. When all of this has come to pass, and her sister-in-law says, yeah, that's pretty much the way it is. You're, you, you, you certainly look like your God hates you, and so I'm going to go back to my family. I mean, I've tried to stay and did my duty. You said go. I'm going to go. Why would I stay? When all that has come to pass, Ruth, Ruth will have none of it. It's so weird. It really is. I mean, she has a commitment to the God of Israel that makes we... Contemporary American Christians slash Lutherans look pretty pathetic by comparison. I mean, we're not even close. We won't miss sports practice for church. And she, she leaves her whole world behind. And, and it isn't, it isn't for a better life. It, don't, don't make that mistake. It, it has nothing to do with Naomi was nicer to her. She came from abusive community. I mean, that's not what any of this is. She was going to live on the streets to beg. But of course, she knew that to be a beggar near the temple of Yahweh was of far greater value than to be a rich man in any other kingdom in the world. And, and don't make... I've said it too often this show, that mistake, don't forget that I'm not just speaking frivolously when I say that it's better to be a beggar by the temple of Yahweh than to be a rich man in any other kingdom. Do you recall that day? Dare I quote yet another Sunday school song, Heaven Help Us, when a blind man stood by the road and he cried. That blind man, he stood by the road and he cried. You know, the poetry, the poetry's not so great. Third time, maybe too much. Blind man stood by the road and he cried. But what did he cry? He cried, oh, son of David, have mercy upon me. And Yeshua, Jesus, 
Jesus of Nazareth. Great, 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 and some more greats, grandson of this little baby Joe Ash. He stopped the procession of his kingdom on the way to ascend his throne, turned aside, touched that beggar's eyes, and gave him sight. How much of that did Ruth get? How much did she understand when she invoked his name as a curse upon herself should she ever do less than seek to follow her mother-in-law back to that land where these promises sat? How much did Jehosheba understand from her marriage to the high priest Jehoiada? What had happened there? I mean, I I'll admit it again. The notion that this marriage was strictly a political alliance as an attempt by whether Jezebel via Athalia or Athalia herself or strictly the idiocy of Joram, son of Jehoshaphat, both of whom should have known better. We covered all of that last time. I'll admit that the notion that there is a plot behind this entire thing going on this entire time that puts this girl in this high priest's home is strictly something I'm reading between the lines. Because it makes sense, and because a good story is a good story. And history, by the way, is usually stranger than anything we could actually make up to take its place. Like I said earlier, it is not just the love of babies that causes her to do this. That is not the way the ancient world thought. You know what could convince her, however, that a baby's life was of value, whether or not he was an heir to the throne of David? Yeah, Christianity could do that. Because that's what Christianity teaches. Whether or not a baby is of royal blood, whether or not... A baby is the only, last, single, possible fulfillment of all the promises of all the prophecies ever. Doesn't matter, high or low, rich or poor. Every single human being, by virtue of the tie to that original promise which David believed that was not first given to David, nor to his forefather Israel, nor to his father Abraham, nor to any man who had come before, but only to one woman. And her name, before that moment, woman. The one deceived, the one who joined the deceiver, and so in deceiving her man broke the world. And yet in his mercy, almighty God had given his son to die for her. And so spoke to her about her son, who would be his son, who would die for her. And in that dying, which could not contain him, in that rising... Sanctify all mankind, every single last one, not only as those created by God the Holy, but then doubly so as those redeemed by Christ the crucified. And yes, those called, gathered, chosen to be enlightened by the sevenfold Spirit of God. Because every single human, whether a clump of cells upon a uterine wall, or a mindless, doting, bumbling fool drooling down the side of his face while watching Oprah at age 85 and dropping giant brown bombs in his own pants, every single one with the flesh of Adam or Eve, Life, her new name, given with the promise. Every single one, mindless or no, awake or no, valuable or no, to the secular, pagan, self-driven mind of the world, every single one is of unesteemable value in the sight of God and therefore in the sight of any who would believe the words of such a God. 
How did this girl come to this faith? What conversations were had between her and Jehoiada? How old was Jehoiada when compared to her? It's not as though the habit of marrying, what, classmates was something that they were used to. So when the high priest is given to take for himself as a wife the daughter of the king, there's a good chance he's not a young high priest. What was it that convinced her? What gentle hand or careful mind in this man, who himself uh, reigned beneath a semi-wicked king, who himself certainly tied to the reign of Jehoshaphat, would not have had no connection with the words of the Torah. What kind of conversations must have happened every Passover and every Feast of Booths between this elderly gentleman, this Arthur of sorts, and the young Guinevere who had been given to be his child bride? And again, forgive me, I don't know I don't. I just know that history rhymes, and I know that even if she was old and he was young, it still must have been a fascinating thing for him to sit there and underneath the gaze of Athaliah, daughter of Jezebel, underneath the gaze of his own king being swayed to allow more and more high places and false worship to take place around them and to diminish the extent to which the worship of Yahweh, according to his word, was happening in that very temple, underneath those watchful gazes to speak to this woman trained in some way to be the plant to destroy and further the worship of false gods directly into the household of the temple by her own offspring to speak to her about the, the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as if they are for her too because they were and to see her convert. At least enough to care about the life of an infant child, and doubly so to care about the life of an infant child who symbolized and represented everything that would destroy her family, and her people, and her native culture, and religion. I am indeed speculating upon the narrow facts, but I'm not telling a false story here. And while we're on it, I'm going to go a little aside for just a moment, because it does strike me even as I say this. I have heard it, I have heard it said and preached at least a little too often. Not, not so much in recent years, but I've also... I've stopped myself from having to listen to the kind of preaching that makes me angry. I just don't anymore. I, I just can't. God bless Chris Roseborough. I don't know how he does it. But I have heard it preached in the past about the... the massive failure of the Hebrew peoples and the Old Covenant to understand the missionary nature of the promises they were given and to refuse to pass these promises on to other nations. And, and so we really ought to be a little more mission-minded these days. We really ought to get our act together and show that we really understand the Word of God unlike them. And they're there to show us how good we can be and how good we are. And so you better get out there and tell your friends and neighbors about Jesus so they can be saved and not go to hell and you can feel better about your white guilt. I'm just not so sure we have the right to... Well, we don't have the right to say a lot of that. We really don't have the right to say that the faithful people of Israel failed to confess Jesus to the nations as they were given to do so. Nor that the nations failed to convert. Because frankly, the scriptures are full of stories just like this one. I mentioned Ruth already. She's not the only one. When the Queen of Sheba comes to visit Solomon to hear his grand wisdom, do you think it was strictly about whether or not to cut infants in two to figure out who the mother is? Or do you think Solomon, in his faith, when he had it, failed to preach? He was called the preacher, for goodness sakes. you think he failed to preach the promises? you think with all of that insight and wisdom he could not discern the ultimate meaning of Torah? And who is to say, honestly, 
that Solomon and his path in the end was not exactly what was needed for that time and place to spread the word of God where it needed to go. Certainly, God never chooses evil, and so God would never have instructed Solomon to disobey his word and marry foreign wives. Oh, there it is again, is it not? And chase after their false religions, and so make such a terrible muck of things that the kingdom of David would be rent in two and get to this place where we find ourselves today with the bloody queen upon the throne and the baby having to be smuggled out in the in the daughter's basket. Yeah, that's all Solomon's fault too. I mean, it's yours and mine. We're not off the hook. We're part of this ridiculous, broken world, broken humanity, broken earth. But God, who is, does change even our worst evils that we intend to be good, but are not, and are evil. He does change them into the good. And who is to say that in the midst of that, and the promises of that, and the wisdom tied to that, and the presence of God at the temple that Solomon saw with his own eyes, that Solomon did not discern all these things? Who is to say that simply because he made one Rather tremendous, foolish error. He never repented. And he never, well, through that repentance, through that failure of his, gleaned the greatest wisdom of all. That what could be gained by human insight was as dross when compared to what was simply given by this holy God, a word that, yes, can and does convert even the heathen, and especially the heathen, perhaps only the heathen. And this is where the arrogance of that earlier comment is just so despicable, that we see ourselves as somehow separated already, as outside of and or above but whoever would preach such a thing must truly believe of him or, sadly these days, herself, that they're really doing it. I remember a, a call-in that happened back when I was listening to Issues Etc. And I would not have ever been known by anybody who listens to Issues Etc. You may not know this at all about me, but I was a listener to that show, great show, for a very good long time before I was ever asked to be on it, discovered it randomly after moving to St. Louis to go to seminary. I've told some of my story about that recently in other places, how when I went there to go to the seminary and become a Lutheran preacher, I really was not a Lutheran by any real stretch of imagination. I had been born into the LCMS, but had left it, and yet I don't know, ridiculously and coincidentally and fortuitously and naively, when I decided as a good, faithful, believing, or I should say practicing Methodist. I wasn't a believing Methodist. I didn't know the Methodist doctrine, but if you put the Methodist doctrine beside what I believed, they would have lined up pretty well. When I decided I needed to be a Methodist preacher, help save the world, I went to the seminary in St. Louis. Why not? It's, I'm, I'm the son of a Lutheran musician. That's what you do. <laughs> oh, the irony the, and the double irony, by the way, the, I mean, those of you who will send me things from time to time asking me which seminary to go to, and, and maybe you're always surprised that I don't advocate St. Louis, I, I, well, you take take that pretty seriously here. Think think that one through. Why don't you advocate St. Louis, Pastor, Pastor Fisk? Maybe someday I will, but um, without going into any dirt, don't you find it a, a little odd that the son of a school who's published multiple high-level bestsellers within the church body. It's never, ever been contacted by that seminary to have any connection with it at all. And yet the other one, well, they have. Why is that? I don't really care. I mean, I don't care. But it kind of, it kind of tells you something, I think. Yeah? Anyhow. The irony to me that <laughs> I'm going deep on the tangent here. We're about three and a half deep on this tangent. But it does remind me. It reminds me of yet another story, and we're still trying to get to the first one. After my first year in the parish, which was just a pain, I was sent 
to a impossible situation. I remember that one of the five laymen that was on the board that was supposed to be overseeing the very small amount of funds that actually got there to help us make this mission plan happen, looked at one of the other leaders after the whole thing had collapsed and was about to close and said, I got to say to you, this was not fair to this young man. And the guy responded, you think that the situation was too difficult for him to handle? And he goes, it was Herculean. Hmm. After that year, in which I was supposed to magically and with great godlike powers fix a failed mission plant in the midst of its failing without ever apparently changing anything, but changing everything at once, I, I won't go into it. You can hear my bitterness. It's kind of ridiculous. Anyhow, I was asked to write up a little bit of a, what, what do you call it, reflection, debriefing for the district that had put me in this <laughs> rather impossible situation. So I did so. And then I, I, because I love my school, I went back to Concordia in St. Louis in order to attend the symposia that fall. I'd always thought the symposia, this kind of gathering of pastors, was kind of a neat thing. It happened to every fall. And fall, by the way, in St. Louis is, is generally a beautiful thing. And so I knew they had these breakout times where you could present a paper. It's kind of an open call. I said, well, goodness, I did all this work. I learned a lot. I really appreciate what St. Louis taught me. And I think, I think I could really, you know, share this here. And man, wasn't it interesting when, I mean, I was accepted as a paper. It was accepted and I was allowed to come in. And then somehow, I don't remember how this happened, but somehow between, must have been my title, somehow between that moment of acceptance and me arriving on campus in order to attend this thing, it, I was then summarily told I would not be allowed to present. Or my topic was, I don't know, not appropriate. And my topic was about mission and how to not do it, <laughs> how to fail it, or, or how to be unprepared for it. To set up things in a way which can't possibly succeed, especially if they're not even remotely connected to what we say we believe. In any case, after a lot of asking questions on campus and at least two conversations with high-level people, I was allowed to give my paper to all seven of my classmates who ended up coming to hear it, so it didn't, didn't really impact very many people, and, and one professor who showed up to to hear it, and who, if I recall correctly afterwards, used the word entitled with reference to me, which eh, might have been true, honestly. But then again, well, it's, it's just, let's just say that there's a little more theology at work in this. I remember the moment of feeling so firmly betrayed by the seminary, by my seminary. And the reason I felt betrayed is because all I was doing was believing what they had taught me. I went to them a Methodist. And the crazy thing is that in spite of all their efforts to turn everyone who goes to them into Methodist now, in practice, they won't say it officially, but in practice it's exactly what's happening. In spite of all those efforts, somehow they accidentally turned me into a Lutheran. It was the darn books they kept assigning if I'd only paid attention to class a little more carefully and ignored those books, I probably would have turned out okay. But unfortunately, some of those books are required reading according to various rules and strictures, and I read them. <laughs> Silly me. I remember that moment, and that feeling of betrayal. And it tied, maybe, maybe in an unfortunate way, but it, it tied closely to a movie moment from my past, and granted, currently, there there have been enough attempts to try to redeem the character of the Joker in the last few years, and, and just they just can't do it. I don't know why. The curse of Heath Ledger somehow hangs over it, and, and by the way, I mean, Heath Ledger was very, very good in that role. It's terrifying. But... That's not the one it reminded me of. I'm much older than that, frankly. Batman, for me... Thank goodness, what was never Ben Affleck or George Clooney or Val Kilmer? I mean, really? Christian Bale, thank goodness, pulled the thing back from the brink of absolute destruction. But Batman was Michael Keaton. 
I mean, Beetlejuice. Yeah, it was it was a weird casting call, but it, it did in fact work. And maybe why it worked is because Joker. Jack Nicholson, was he ever bad at anything? You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? Well, besides politics. Here's Johnny! In any case, oh, we, have, we have gone so deep on this tangent, we may never get back. In the original Batman the movie, with Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson, there is a moment where, at the beginning of the story, Batman tries to stop some guys from stealing a bunch of chemicals from the uh, Gotham chemical plant. I should know what that's called, but I don't. In any case, one of these guys falls over a ledge, and Batman, Michael Keaton, catches his hand and is trying to stop him from falling into this pit of boiling chemicals. And it happens to be Jack Nicholson's character, and he is unable to hold on. He really doesn't want to let him fall. That's not Batman's MO. You know that. He doesn't kill people. He just beats him up and then puts him in the prison where they escape from so they can do more damage later. Because apparently there's no... No capital punishment for completely insane mass murderers in Gotham. In any case, well, it's Chicago, you know. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah, I said it. Okay. Anyhow, Jack falls in. Jack. Well, yeah, that's his name, Jack, in the story, too. Jack falls in. He comes out white. He turns into the Joker. He goes crazy and does all this stuff. But there's another moment later in the movie where it's all happening again. And Batman's holding on to Joker's hand and... They're having a conversation about, you know, why he would do all these evil things. And and Joker yells at Batman. You made me. You made me. And uh, Batman has a leg up on him at this point because there's also, and you should know this, right? There's also this reality that way back in the day when Bruce Wayne was a little boy, and his parents were brutally murdered by a psychopath in front of his eyes on the back streets of Gotham City in spite of their attempts to make the city a good place with all their wealth and whatnot. That the guy who, well, it's not in every version of the story, but in, in Batman the movie version of the story, the guy who did that is the Joker before he became the Joker. And so, of course, Batman says back to him, you made me first, which is pretty petty if you think about it. Even so, I remembered that movie moment at that time when I'm back at my alma mater seminary saying, look, you sent me out to die, and I nearly did, and I've crawled back here to quite try to share with you what I've discovered about our theology and practice, and and you want to tell me that somehow I've got this negative agenda to like harm you? Now, you made me. You made me this Lutheran, so well, here I am. In any case, this is a tangent upon a tangent. Let's see if we can dig it all the way back from Batman to Concordia Seminary. And, well, you know, I don't know. They, they, they don't seem to like me, so if you like me and I, you want to ask me where you should go, I'm going to say don't go there. And maybe someday that'll change, but at the moment they just haven't seemed to want to change my mind on that. And so, well, there it is. There's my mind. But long before my mind could have even come to such a position, I was going there myself, and I got there a little bit early in the summer before class would start, although too late to be able to get into the Greek class with all the other summer Greek guys. I wish I'd known about it. I probably would have done it. Got there a little bit early, and so I had a whole summer to kill, and I, I got a couple of jobs, most of them small-time student aid kind of stuff. But every day, it was very hot. It was St. Louis in July, and so I would I would retreat to our ridiculously dirty and disgusting and smoke-smelling apartment south of town, owned by a Lutheran who rented almost exclusively the upper story to seminary students, and then the lower story to people who yelled and played loud music and smoked all the time. And in any case, uh, I would ret retreat there to our little house where we didn't even have a kitchen table, but we did have a hammock. And I would lie in the hammock from 3 to 5 or even 6 p.m. in the evening. And I would listen to the only Christian radio I could find. I really wanted to listen to the more popular Christian radio I was accustomed to, the one I'd been listening to in California with all the great music. But instead, there was this little AMA 50 station, KFUO, which, frankly, I couldn't stand most of it. But from 3 to 6 in the afternoons, there was a show called Issues, etc. And I would listen... 
at length to issues, etc. I would eat it up. That's why I went to seminary was for this kind of teaching. And maybe, maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's why I'm not a son of that seminary is because, well, they made me first. Maybe. In any case, they certainly became a part of my listening habit, and that continued all the way through seminary, although I don't think I listened as much on Vicarage or fourth year. I tried to work with them fourth year. That was nipped in the bud not by them so much as by the seminary that didn't think that working with them would be of value to me in my education. I mean, why is that? And yeah, granted, the guy who said that uh, no longer works there. He's moved on to more lucrative positions in the Synod. But, but, sorry, but yeah, it's true. Why, why, nonetheless, would that be a position that would be taken in any case? It's not like they had their show canceled and got fired for entirely political reasons that are directly tied to the back and forth between conservative, confessional, liturgical holding to what the Bible actually says Lutheranism in our church body and the history of trying to derail ourselves from all of those things at once or one at a time, but kind of hand in hand all the way. It's not like that's a thing either. I mean, oh wait, yes, it is. And yeah, if you're on the other side of the liturgical battle, it doesn't mean you don't believe the Bible's true, but you are hitched to a wagon that eventually goes there. And if you haven't figured out how or why, well, that's a different topic, and maybe we'll get there someday. But it does. Because when you adopt the postmodern point of view that everything has got to be contextualized in order to have any real truth in it, then you've basically said there is no truth. And so you, while you believe the Bible's text is inerrant, you don't believe its meaning is. In any case, as I continued to listen at some point, certainly after I received this initial call to go out and die on the East Coast in this little tiny place where I was eventually not only without a job, but then blackballed by the district who called me there. Yeah, probably all my fault anyway. I, I remember listening to Issues Etc. with great regularity. It was my lifeline. If I had not had the gospel being given to me by then, I would not have had it at all. And at that point, they interviewed somebody. I don't know who. It was one of these these more famous interviews they used to do, where they'd get somebody from a very radical theological position, liberal or otherwise, and have a real hour-long conversation with them, and then tear them apart in, an hour, in the second hour afterwards. And eventually all the publicists got word of this, and they stopped getting those interviews. In any case, I remember one of those interviews, and, and Todd was doing a good job dissecting what had been said, and there was a phone call that came in, and this phone call was not from somebody famous. It was from a listener. And I, if I recall, the guy said, I'm a Baptist. Maybe not. He said, I'm just a non-denominational Christian. But he really laid into Todd pretty hard. He He got on him about how we Lutherans, we sit here and we think we're so smart and we think we know all of this truth and we have all of this doctrine. And then, well, I mean, the whole point of this entire series of tangents is to get to what he said next. He said, but we're the ones getting it done. And what he meant by that was if you look at mission, it's the Baptists who are converting people who aren't Christian to Christianity. Now, we could debate this, I think, a little bit. We, we certainly could debate how authentic these conversions are, how much of it is the salting of the fields so that those who come in are sent out twice a son of the devil as they were before. But I don't think we could argue too much about the fact that Lutherans don't make new Christians very often. And there is something there. I mean, that is sort of the mad Christian frustration at the moment, but but that's not really where I want to go. Where I want to go is this arrogant modern presumption that somehow we're doing it, and the ancient Israelites didn't. It's the same thing, right? This guy's shouting at us, and maybe we are doing it. I mean, every baby, I suppose, that's born is baptized into Christ is a true conversion. We just don't believe it for some reason. Oh, wait, is it because we don't value him in life? Could it be? Maybe. Even so. The point here is that the ancient Israelites were not unchristian, were not anti-mission, and did not fail. Simply because their mission never left the land. Hey, do you remember how their mission was, in fact, to stay in the land? Maybe, maybe you missed that point. 
It was kind of the whole thing. It was, it was go to this land and from this land I will bless the entire world. It wasn't as though that all the nations weren't invited to this land to receive the blessings that were being given from this land at this temple. It wasn't as though Solomon's reign was not for the world. In any case, faithful Jehoiada is sitting there over dinner, whether it's a festival or not, over the course of a life with this lady, and he, what, he wins her soul for Jesus? He gives the good confession. He tells her of not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their greatness, but of their sin and redemption. And of the sin of the world and its redemption, of the promises of atonement, of sacrificial intersection in which God himself will stand between us and our great enemy death to deliver the promises in all fullness as he spoke to our fathers of old that we might have the son of peace rise upon us and so be raised from our graves to have our covenant with death annulled and Jehosheba daughter of Athaliah, daughter of Jezebel, believes this, and so she sees that boy, and she hears the blood-curdling cries, and she's aware of the chaos, and probably of the entire plan, and she grabs that baby, and she gets the heck out of the palace, and she hides him in the house of the high priest, hides him with her own son, his name is Zechariah, and they raise him quietly, secretly. Through six years of the bloody queen's terrifying, infanticidal reign. And most of this, so far as I understand it, is, is lost to history. I can't tell you one way or the other what was going on. I know that in the north, Jehu, who had wiped out the rest of Ahab's line, her accepted, was continuing to establish his rule and then begin to fall apart. I mean, initially, he almost, almost is faithful. He had been, after all, anointed by God to the task to which he was called. It doesn't really work out so well. That's another story for another day. But she's down there during that time. He's establishing himself, and she's establishing herself for six years, and she thinks things are going pretty well, although she really has no idea, I suppose, that the... What? The more she tightens her grip, the more star systems slip through her fingers. And one day, the high priest calls a special assembly and doesn't tell her about it, but there's a whole lot of people who show up at it. And at that day, he presents this seven-year-old boy named Joash. Before all the assembly, he declares, this is the last living seed of the house of David. The last living fulfillment of the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The last living hope of the life of the world. And he declares that he is the rightful king, that this bloody Mary sitting upon the throne has no business being there at all, being, of course, a witch herself. Before you know it, there is an uprising, there is a mutiny and the sword now, is not destroying her grandchildren, but it is piercing her own heart too, dare I say. Nathalia is cast down. Joash is raised to be king. I'd like to tell you that the story has a happy ending. Things go okay so long as Jehoiada remains alive. That is, as long as the counselor to this young king was the strong-handed and clever high priest of Yahweh who apparently really believed all this stuff and had this good wife by his side so long as he was there to advise the thing king pretty well. In fact, they do a lot of work on the temple in order to rebuild it. There's a whole segment in Second Chronicles about this, about the way that there was a chest set up in order to receive offerings, how the money came in in abundance and enabled them to hire carpenters and masons to restore the house of the Lord. They worked with iron. They worked with bronze. 
It's the kind of thing that would make for a great capital campaign sermon series, you know, if you weren't a Lutheran at all. But after all of this, and, and it is a while, I mean, Jehoiada lives to be 130 years old. He doesn't good in Israel, but he, but he does die. And it isn't too long after his death that the clan leaders of Judah, the, the princes of the various houses, they come and they they begin to exert their own pressure upon Joash. They're like, hey, look. Yeah, we get it. It's, it's a cool looking temple now, but up in the north they got these they got these golden cows. And they seem to be really working pretty well for them. I mean things are going good for the house of Jehu, so why not what you say and us make ourselves a little like him? I mean, we'll, we'll serve the Lord God, but we'll also serve some of these Asherim and, and, and their idols, and maybe this will really help us out, right? Now, we're told that prophets were sent among them at this time, and again, the whole point here is to dig into these prophets, but things got pretty bad. Zechariah, not the minor prophet so far as the text we have is concerned, but the son of Jehoiada, the priest, the one who had been raised in the house with Joash. He finds himself one day clothed with the Spirit of God. And as a result, he enters into the midst of all the people, and he begins to shout at them about their rejection of Yahweh. He said, why do you break the words of God? That's why you don't prosper. You've forsaken Yahweh, and that's why he has forsaken you. And he's doing this, by the way, we know this from Jesus, he's doing this in the courts of the temple. And in the courts of the temple, that day, they conspired against him. And at Joash's word, they stoned him to death. They crushed his head with rocks. At Joash's word. His half-brother who lived in the house with him while he was protected by this aunt of his from his own grandmother killing him. What story is that? What conflict between these two had arisen in which one retains the faith and the other drifts further and further away so that eventually he, he kills his own brother? Jesus is pretty serious about this when he brings it up. He, he uses it as an example of all of our faithlessness is how we are the ones who whitewash the tombs of the prophets. We, we paint them with pretty symbols. We say and sing songs. You know, These are the days of Elijah, right? We, we do all this kind of stuff. But do we listen to their words? Do we even bother to figure out who they are? Do we let their great cloud of witness testify against our dark and evil age. Now again, it does not end well for Joash, son of Ahaziah, son of Jehoshaphat, grandson of Athaliah, great-grandson of Jezebel. It does not end well for him. His country is infiltrated by a group of Syrians. They are a small group. I mean, the Bible says that they're an army, but they were in no way of the size that really should have been able to sneak into the city of Jerusalem, ransack it, send the spoil back to the king of Damascus, and then leave the king himself, Joash, basically bleeding on his own pavement. They didn't kill him. They just left him there wounded, and when his own servants saw him there wounded, uh, well, they they killed him in, in his bed. Like, he's there. Like, the healers are there, and they shut the door behind them. I mean, it's, again, it's right out of Game of Thrones. And he goes, oh, you know, I mean, just imagine, oh, 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 my beloved, whatever, you know. You're here at last to ease this pain and, and, and restore me to health. He says, yes, my Lord. And he comes closer and he's got like this needle in his hand, right? I mean, what is it? Whatever it is, he comes close and the eyes of the king begin to bulge. He says, wait a minute. He says, no, don't worry, my Lord. This is this is for your good. And he, he puts this thing into him. But then the, the pain and the shaking begins, right? And he tries to speak, tries to yell, and he can't at all. And that point, 
A knife is produced, slid gently up under his throat, into the base of his skull and his brain, and there he dies. Joash, king of Judah, heir to the throne of David. Now, it, it, it ends horribly, but, but the good news is that even though conspiring against him were Zabad, son of Shimeeth, and Jehoshabad, son of Shimrith, a Moabite, by the way. In spite of all of that, he has a, a son himself who's still alive. His son is named Amaziah. Amaziah, king of Judah, and he's 25 years old when he begins to reign. He establishes his power. He invokes vengeance upon those who'd killed his father. He even does a few good things. And on the story goes. On the story goes. What's the story? The story of the seed. The story of the line. Not the story of good and faithful men all the way along, but the story of a promise tracking along faithful even when we are faithless, able to discern good and evil, truth and falsehood, piercing between joint and marrow, never, ever taking its eyes, his eyes, off the ultimate goal of that throne, which is not the reign of men, but the salvation of mankind and the life of the entire world. On that promise goes through this young man, Amaziah, <laughs> Not to be confused with his grandpa Ahaziah, but but here's the thing. Here's the thing. You just gotta see. You gotta know that Amaziah, son of Joash, son of Ahaziah, is therefore the grandson of Athaliah, and thereby the great grandson of Jezebel, and he, along with all of his sons after him, thereby carry the blood of Jezebel, which queen of Sidon, that the blood of Ethbaal, which king of the Sidonians, carry that blood in their veins all the way down to that. Was he old? Was he young? That man, Joseph, and then she was young, Mary. Both descended from Zerubbabel, both from Jehiachin, taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he's J2, son of Jehiakim, J1, inherits his rebellion, is put in the pit, but is brought out eventually by Nebuchadnezzar's son and given a place at the table so that his lineage can continue on and Zerubbabel can go back and reestablish the temple and the foundations and all this that eventually gets us to Joseph all the way. The blood of Jezebel is in the veins. So that that little baby, born in Bethlehem, the angels singing over his incarnation, heathen kings coming to bow down before him according to the word of God and his mission among them, among us. All the way down, it is not the purity of the bloodline of David that is the real value of this child. But that bloodline has been obscured time and time again throughout history by harlot and false prophet and a mixture of both. But no blood is too dirty to fail to be cleaned by the Son of God, by Jesus. No beggar is too blind to be beyond the reach of the words that change death into life. No prophet or king or story is so minor so as to not be written in the ancient scriptures for the purpose of pointing us to his utter and complete fulfillment of all things, including your hope in himself on the cross. No game of thrones is so distorted by the bloody and wretched deeds of men. No civilization is so uncleaned by our hatred of the unborn that the one who is the way and the truth and the life does not hold within himself 
the power to be our antidote. No lie is so untrue as to overcome the promise that Christ is for you. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Yes, we can, Jack. Yes, we can. There's more. Right, 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 right. No doubt the facts have been exaggerated. Yes. Namely, you know about the other. Uh, say an unstoppable force. And suspecting the discourage can be wiped out. You say it. Well. The city's inhabitants are losing their minds. Uh. Trigger warning. This ain't a safe space. Compulsory insanity. I'm going. Yes, completely, utterly confused. If you're doing what everyone else is doing, you're doing it bad. Was that worth a dollar? Click the Patreon link in the show notes to sign up. Pretty please? 